All right, we'll be in Galatians chapter 3, and I'll tell you, um, we'll go away from there for a while, but we will come back to it, so keep your, keep your place there in Galatians chapter 3. Even after we read it, we'll come back to it for a while. We are in Advent, which is the season of coming, a season of preparation to celebrate the birth of Christ, uh, and also the second coming of Christ to focus us on that. Um, so we're glad that you're here this morning. We're looking forward to digging into this together, and um, we're, we're going through a series this Advent season, uh, on Jesus is the Son. He is the Son. So last week we looked at He is the Son of Mary and Joseph. This week is He is the Son of Abraham. Next week, David. The next week, the Son of Man. Christmas Eve, we will look at Him being the Son of God. And I will remind you that we do have a Christmas Eve candlelight service at 6 p.m. for all those uh, that are planning to make that. We will be having that on Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. Looking forward to it. One of my favorite services of the entire year. Um, so... We're looking at Jesus as the son of Abraham today. Uh, the first covenant that God made with, his, with, with the mankind is the Noahic covenant, covenant, the covenant he made with Noah that he would never destroy the, uh, the earth again by flood. And so if the Noahic covenant, covenant is the stable foundation on which all the other covenants are built, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with Abraham, the one we'll be looking at today, is the cornerstone from which the rest of the building is framed. Uh, it reveals God's intention to restore the original creation blessing before sin. It reveals that this will be done through the nation Israel, but that it will be done uh, for the benefit and blessing of all nations, of all peoples, that it will come through Israel, but it will be for all. Uh, and that's what we're kind of digging into to today. So if you've never really understood that, hopefully you'll understood it, understand it. Excuse me, I cannot talk today. Hopefully you will understand it uh, as we get through this today. So, um, this Advent season, I just want, we don't always do this, we used to do it all the time, but this Advent season, if you would uh, stand with me as a symbol of respect and honor for God's holy infallible word as we read these verses together today. Brothers, I'm using a human illustration. No one sets aside or makes additions to even a human covenant that has been ratified. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds as though referring to many, but referring to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Verse 17, and I say this, the law which came 430 years later does not revoke a covenant that was previously ratified by God and cancel the promise. For if the inheritance is from the law, it is no longer from the promise, but God granted it to Abraham through the promise. Father God, we thank you today that your Promises never fail, God, that your promises you keep. You don't, you don't say something and not come through, God. And we, I pray that as we look at this promise that you have given to Abraham today, God, that we would realize that we are co-heirs in the blessings of that promise for those who are in Christ Jesus, who have faith in your son and what you have done to redeem us back to you, God. I pray that in the matchless holy name of Jesus, amen. Please have a seat. So again, we're looking at Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. This is Advent. Again, the season of preparation as the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus, comes and is born to a woman, Savior of the world. We're looking at Jesus as the son this, ad, this Advent season. Last week, his human side is what we looked at with his earthly adopted father, Joseph, and his biological mother, Mary. So if you missed that, you can always go back. Uh, and, and catch that on fbcdan.com. Uh, but this week is Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, which may bring up questions for some of you. Questions like, how is Jesus the son of Abraham? If he's the son of Mary and Joseph, how is he the son of Abraham? What does it mean to be the son of Abraham? Why does that even matter to me? Why are we even talking about this? Who? Maybe some of you are thinking, maybe you didn't grow up in church or in Sunday school and those types of things, and you're thinking, who is Abraham? I don't even know who that is and what are these promises that are given to him. Well, I'm so glad you asked those questions. Let's get started. The first question is, is Jesus the son of Abraham? Before we even get to who Abraham is, let's just answer that question first. Is Jesus the son of Abraham? Let's go to the very first gospel, the very first book in the Bible that is about the earthly life of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, and see what is said about Jesus being the son of Abraham. First verse, first gospel, 
the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, maybe you've caught that before. Maybe you've skimmed over it. Maybe you haven't thought about it at all. But there it says it right there. The very first words directly spoken about the earthly life of Jesus, because all of Scripture is about Jesus. But the first words spoken, written about Jesus, who he is, where he came from, what is this guy, who is this guy, why are we still talking about this guy that died 2,000 years ago, lived 2,000 years ago, Jesus. It says that he is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus. Yeshua, Yahweh the Savior. We say Jesus, in Hebrew it would have been Yeshua, which means Yahweh the Savior. Came and was born a man. He is God incarnate. And we have both his mother's biological genealogy and his father's legal genealogies to show that Jesus is the son of Abraham. Both of them show this. The Jews especially Jews that were of the line of David, were meticulous record keepers because they knew the Messiah would come of the line of David. That's what was prophesied, so they wanted to keep a record of that so that they could prove that because obviously you were hoping that it came from your line. Same reason why we do Ancestry.com and 23andMe and all that stuff because it's cool to know where you came from. Sometimes you find out things you didn't really want to know, but either way. So these records uh, were, tradi were traditionally told that these records were of public record. These records of, of genealogies, they were public records. These are facts. These are historical facts about the man Jesus. Jesus is literally the son of Abraham. We have the genealogies to show that. Okay, but why does that matter? And who is Abraham? Glad you asked. Let's take it way back. Let's take it way back. The world and the bloodline of mankind was so corrupted that God had to start over. He had, he had to kill everything except for Noah, his three sons, and their three wives, and the animals that Noah took upon the ark. And we know that he, 40 days and 40 nights, it rains, and a great flood wipes out every living thing. It must be started over. Think, the bloodline was so corrupted of man that God says, we've got to start over, we've got to do this again. To which there is geological evidence of, by the way, of a global flood. That's neither here nor there. That's just me being a nerd. After the flood recedes, we're given the records of the three sons that Noah has, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem being the one of the two sons that didn't participate in the shaming of Noah, and therefore one of the two sons that's not cursed by his father Noah. Ham, the one that is cursed by his father Noah, is the father of the Canaanites, which is who's in living in the land, basically the long and short sweet of that, the enemies of Israel. So they're, they're cursed by Noah, it's tracing that story all the way through. The enemies of Israel, way later on, are these people that come from Ham, one of the three sons. Shem has a bunch of sons, and you go on down the list to, in Genesis 11, if I click the right slide, I can't see this morning. There we go. Genesis 11 says, Nahor lived 29 years and fathered Terah. After he fathered Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So you don't, we don't get everything. We get what matters. Terah lived 70 years and fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Three sons that are talked about that are of Terah. That's in Genesis 11 for those that care. This is the first mention in Scripture of Abraham. Now, I know it says Abram here, but he is Abraham. We'll get to that later. This was about 2,000 years B.C. when Abram was born. Uh, it's about 4,000 years ago. Abraham uh, had his name changed by God later to Abraham. Abram had his name changed to God. I told you all I can't talk this morning. It's been one of the mornings. It's too many... Too many like words for my tongue. Abram had his name changed by God to Abraham. Hey. <laughs> but it's the same guy. So every time we're reading this morning, it says Abram or Abraham. It's the same person. It just depends on where we're reading. So we have over 2,000 years of history in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. 
Okay, not a lot is included in there, obviously. The point is not telling you everything that happened from the time God spoke the universe into existence all the way through. That's not the point. The point of all of it is to tell us how it started and got to Abraham. That's the point of the first 11 chapters of Scripture. So back to our question. Who is Abraham? Why does he matter? And therefore, why does it matter that Jesus is the son of Abraham? Well, turn, uh, excuse me, well, the turn of Scripture starts in the next chapter. I mean, like, the turn in the story. If there were music playing behind it and it was a movie, the music would change and you would know something big is happening. And uh, in chapter 12, it says, I cannot click the right ones today. I'm sorry, guys. I can't read. It says this. This is Genesis chapter 12, the turn. The Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Lot's dad had died, so Abram was his keeper. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people he had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. They were living in this land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you, I will give this land to your offspring. So he built, he being Abram, he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. The turn in scripture. 11 chapters leading up to this point. A lot of things that matter in those 11 chapters, but it's all getting to this point. These promises that God makes to this man at the time Abram, who becomes Abraham. Now, the CSBN says, God saying, I will five times here, unilaterally promised Abram three things, progeny, prominence, and protection. This was a unilateral covenant. If you read through there, you will see this. God chose Abraham and said that he would make him into a great nation, give him descendants, that is progeny, that he would bless him and make his name great, that is prominence, and bless those who curse and curse those who treat you with contempt, that is protection. And because of this, the ultimate fulfillment of all of this is that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. Genesis 12.3. He shows him the land where this will actually physically take place, which is why, in case you've never put two and two together, it's called the promised land where the nation of Israel is supposed to reside because God promised it to Abraham. Abraham is the first Jew of the nation of Israel. He is the first Israelite, even though the Israelites are named after his grandson. He is the first one. It comes from him. He is the father. That's why we used to sing. Father Abraham. I know I can count on you, Sarah. <laughs> father Abraham. Okay. A little throwback in time there. Children's church. That's fun. That's, that's why we sang that song. Because this promise is given to Abraham. Okay. A great nation, his name would be made great. We would bless those, and he would bless and, and who bless and curse those who curse. He would protect Abraham. He would protect the line of Abraham. He was going to do something through these people. He was going to redeem mankind from its sinful state through this man. It's an incredible. You couldn't make this story up if I gave you a million years and a million tries. You couldn't do it. It's a God story. It's amazing. You know. <clears throat> Side note, real quick, I promise, real quick. It's, it's funny to me that it says he will make his name great. You know, a couple years ago, our nation, uh, along with many other nations in the Middle East, they, were, they signed a peace 
agreement between Israel and several of the Middle East nations. What did they call that peace agreement? Anybody know? None of y'all pay attention to this kind of stuff? They called it the Abraham Accords. Just, I don't know, I couldn't stop thinking about that this week. That Here we are, 4,000 years later, and we're still talking about this man and this, this name that God said he would make great. So, Abraham, not understanding all of this, he didn't understand what God was saying, trust me, just like we don't most of the time. Not understanding this, he went. That's faith. Hope and trust in action. Often understanding coming later after the action in trust. So that's what he does. He says, what's going on here? If you catch this here, I will give this land to your offspring. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared. And so he goes, God promises land to Abraham to fulfill this promise, and Abraham does the only proper thing to this. When God speaks to you, when God says he will bless you, when God does bless you, when you're in the presence of God, there is only one proper response. What is his response here? He worships. That's it. That's our response. He worships. He builds an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. He builds an offer. Why? To mark this, to mark this down, to, to do something to give thanks to God, to give him an offering. He worships. That is the response to God when he speaks to us. Now, the ceremony in which this promise was made covenant is in chapter 15 of Genesis. God says he's going to do it, and then there's a ceremony in chapter 15 where Abram has a vision, uh, and God reaffirms his promise to make him great. Abraham says, Lord, I trust, but how can this be? I'm 75 years old without a son. One of my servants is going to inherit all that I have. How can this possibly be, Lord? And then we pick it up in verse 5. He took him outside and said, look at the star, at the sky, excuse me, and count the stars. Look at the sky and count the stars, Abraham. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. God says, just trust me, Abraham. Trust me. I know it doesn't make sense. There's no way you can understand what I'm doing. I'm God, and you're a man. This is going to happen. And one of the most important verses in all of Scripture comes next. Think about it. Think about what God has just told Abraham. Abraham is 75 years old, childless, Venturing out on his own, away from family, away from all he knows, to a stranger's land. And God says, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars. I don't know if you've stargazed lately, but there's quite a few up there. I mean, quite a few up there. And the darker and clearer it is, the more and more we can see. This week, I was able to go spend a couple days with my cousin, Jacady, duck hunting in Kansas. It was amazing. And out there on the prairie in Kansas, it's kind of like south, southeast Arkansas, eastern Arkansas. It's very flat, and you can see a lot. And, and, you, and you have to get out there early. The sun hasn't even really come up. The moon was, was, was bright, full moon shining bright, and the sky was just as clear as it possibly could be. Not a single cloud in the sky and you could just see stars after stars after stars after stars and it was breathtaking it was worth it just to be there for that killing a few ducks was a cherry on top so God reassures Abraham of this crazy illogical seemingly impossible promise and what does Abraham do what does Abraham do in response to what God says? What does he do? You know. Abram believed the Lord. And he credited to him, he being God, credited to him as righteousness. Abraham had faith. He didn't understand it. He didn't know how God was going to do it. All he knew was God says, I'm going to do this. And Abraham believed and the Lord credited it to him as Righteousness. He had faith. He believed. He trusted God would make what he has said he will do come to pass. And God credited to his account righteousness. It, it didn't say any longer, 
in debt to God for sin. That's what that means. No longer does his, his spiritual bank account say in debt to God for sin. No more. It does not say that anymore. It says righteous by faith. I trust that God can someday make this payment even though I cannot. I trust that somehow God can make this payment. He can do it. He's going to do it. Then Abraham said, Lord, how do I know this is the land? That this will all happen. See how it's okay to ask God questions when you don't understand? These aren't robots, super God followers. They have questions. They don't understand. They have doubts. They don't, it doesn't make sense to them. And he asks a question. God, how do I know this is going to be the land? I mean, you just stood here with me and said, this is the land. But how do I know this is the land? How do, you, how do I know? And God said, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he, Abraham, split the cow and the goat, laid them on either side, and put a bird on each side, preparing to make a covenant. This is how you made a covenant with someone. Then the Lord said to Abram, know this for certain, your offspring will be foreigners in a land that does not belong to them. They will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. This is when they are taken to Egypt, way after the fact. However, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterward they will go out with many possessions, but you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. It's not quite time yet for this to happen, Abraham, but it's going to happen right here. And here's what's going to happen, so your people will know that this is going to happen. And then... And then, when the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot, I'm in chapter 17 for those that are there, and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. We'll read that again. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, I will give this land to your offspring from the brook of the Egypt to the Euphrates River. Now, this is key. In a bilateral covenant, each party in the covenant, like if, it's, like if it's you and me, Steve, if it's a bilateral covenant, there's something you got to do and there's something I got to do in order for that covenant to stay in place. And if we, one of us doesn't do it, then the covenant is now null and void. That's a bilateral covenant. And you're saying, as you pass through the separate animals, you're saying, may this be what happens to me, separated like these animals, if I don't keep my end of this covenant. That's what, it, that's what it means. May I be separated in two. May I be cut asunder, as the King James would say. But not here. That's not what happens here. Only the smoking pot and torch, the symbols of sacrifice, the symbols of representing God, only that passed through to make this covenant, a unilateral covenant. God was saying, this covenant is on me and on me alone. I'm going to make this happen, period. You can't stop me. Nobody can stop me. I'm going to make this happen. It is a promise of God, and God's promises always come to pass. He always fulfills his, his promises. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to make this happen. It is my will, and you will not be able to mess it up. It is my grace and my grace alone, and that's a good thing. Because Abraham, at the urging of his wife, let that linger for a second. After 11 years from this time that this happens and this covenant that's taken, takes place, 11 years later, Abraham takes matters into his own hands and has a son with his wife's servant, Hagar. And God says, nope, that ain't it, not him, wrong. Not happening. The, the sun is coming from me. And you will know it's from me and that I am making this happen because Sarah cannot bear children. She was barren. A terrible thing to be in ancient times. It will take a miracle of birth, God is saying, for this line from you to happen. God reconfirms this covenant again in chapter 17 as Abraham is 99 years old. And he changes his name from Abram, which is the father is exalted, to Abraham, which is the father of a multitude, which is why he changes his name. And he says this in chapter 17. I was in 15 earlier, sorry. Misspoke. God also said to Abraham, as for you, 
you and your offspring after you throughout their generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant, which you are to keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. And these are the parts that we skip over in Sunday school because it's weird. And it makes us uncomfortable, especially talking to kids. But stop and ask the question, why circumcision? Have you ever thought about that? Of all things God could have chosen as a sign for his covenant with Abraham, why this? Why not like a stamp on the thumb or on the, on the hand or something? Like, why this, God? I believe it's because God was starting a physical people for himself through an act of God, a miracle, and this would be a physical reminder to them, the physical people from Abraham, the physical Jews, the physical Israelites, it would be a physical reminder to them that they exist because God caused them to exist. And when they would do the thing that would cause another one of them to exist, it would literally be there for them to remember, oh yeah, we started because God made us Start. It's a physical reminder of what God has done. A physical reminder that the first son of Abraham, who is Isaac, only came to be because God caused a miracle to happen in his elderly, barren mother, Sarah, and his elderly, disobedient father, Abraham. Naturally, Abraham's response to this, this right here, you said it, Lord, let it be done. I'm your servant, and, and I'll serve your will. That's his response, right? Nope. What does he say? Abraham fell face down and laughed at God. Can a child be born to a 100-year-old man? Can Sarah, a 99-year-old barren woman, give birth? So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. Don't miss this because we're coming back to the Galatians in a minute. Don't miss this right here. He laughed at God, basically said, no way this is going to happen, God. And then, like every other human being ever, said, why can't my works to accomplish your will be good enough? God, why can't my works to accomplish your will be good enough? You catch that? Come on, why can't that be good enough? You wanted me to have offspring as numerous as the stars. I had a son with Hagar. Why can't that be good enough for you? Is what Abraham is saying. I'm trying to justify myself. I'm just trying to help out, God. Obviously, you may have forgotten what you said you're going to do. I mean, it was 25 years ago you gave me this promise, and I still ain't got a kid through Sarah. How in the world is this going to happen? I'll just take matters into my own hands, and that can be acceptable to you, God. It's the story of mankind. We try to stand before a holy God and justify ourselves with our works, and it will never, ever happen. All it will do is make you miserable, bitter, regretful, mean, nasty. That's what it does, because it comes from a place of pride, a place of sin. It's not what we've been called to do. What does God do when Abraham says this? He smites him, right, with thunder and lightning. He chastises him for his insubordinate laughter and doubt, right? Nope. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. What does he say? But God said, no. Your wife, Sarah, will bear a son. And you're going to name him Isaac, which is hilarious. I will confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his future offspring. Isaac means, those of you who've been in Sunday school, What? He laughs. God said, you're going to name him. He laughs. Every time you have to say his name, you're going to remember that you laughed in my face when I told you this was going to happen. You think it's funny. God says, okay, I have a sense of humor also. You'll have a son by Sarah, and you'll name him. He laughs since you are Johnny Doubter that thinks he's a comedian. Abraham then goes on to get circumcised and circumcises all the males of his household. Abraham, 99 at this time, Ishmael, his first son, 13. It's been a lot that has happened, right? There's a lot of time that takes place in these. Remember that when you're reading. It's not all just... And then a lot happens in the next year after this. He gets circumcised and a lot happens in the next year. A lot of stuff you can go off and read on your own. And then in chapter 21, it says this in Genesis chapter 21. The Lord said to Sarah, 
as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time <sighs> had told him. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one Sarah bore to him, making sure we understand this, Isaac. When his son Isaac was eight, eight days old, which is, this is the law, eight days old, Abraham circumcised him, his son Isaac. As God had commanded him, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And thus, the beginning of the promises of chapter 12 beginning to be fulfilled. So these are the promises to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, that an ethnic, physical Jews would exist. A literal descendants of Abraham would exist. This is what makes them Jewish or makes them sons of Abraham. But back to what Paul said in our verses in Galatians. See, Paul is dealing with Judaizers in the church, troublemakers for the church. I know it's hard to believe that there's troublemakers in the church. He's trying to deal with these troublemakers and they're trying to make salvation by faith in Jesus and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say it's faith in Jesus and. It's faith in Jesus and. And that's not a real thing. The faith in Jesus and issue at this time is circumcision. They're saying, yeah, you got to have faith in Jesus, but to be a son of Abraham, you gotta, you got to do this thing. To which all the 30, 40, 50 year old men were like, no, nah, I'm out. I don't want to do that. That's weird. Right? And so, he's, that's what he's dealing with. To be saved, say these Judaizers, you must have faith in Jesus and be circumcised. And Paul's argument from our first verse is, the promise to Abraham comes before the law. He promised it first. The promise or unilateral covenant can only be changed by God since he made it in the first place. A covenant can only be changed by the parties that make the covenant. And God unilaterally made this covenant. So if he was going to change it, only he can change it. Not you, not me, not anybody else. God didn't do that. He didn't change it. So the seed or the son that God promised to be able to fulfill this promise to bless the whole earth all the families of the earth is still a promise God has intact. And that promise has been fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. That's what Paul was saying in those first verses that we're reading. The one we have all been waiting on is here. And back to our original verses. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to the seeds as though referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed who is Christ. Christ is the one that will bless the whole earth and fulfill the Abrahamic covenant, the promise to Abraham. It came through the physical descendants of Abraham, just like God said it would, but it's for everyone, just like God says it was. It will bless all the families of the earth. Check, check this out. Hopefully you, you kept your place in, chapter, in Galatians chapter 3, like I said. Back up to Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Just as Abraham believed and it was credited to him for righteousness, oh, then understood that those who have faith are Abraham's, understand that those who have faith are Abraham's son. As we read earlier from Genesis, right, where it was credited to, credited to Abraham because of his faith, Paul says those who have faith are Abraham's sons. Whoa! Whoa! You and I, believers, are sons of Abraham. He continues explaining it in verse 8. Seals chapter 3 of Galatians. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Abraham had faith and it was credited to him as righteousness, and God now includes you and I and everyone that ever has placed faith in his one seed, Jesus, in those blessings because of faith. Not because, here's my son Ishmael, I took it into my own hands. No, because you trust that God really is that good, that loving, wants you to know him. 
So we're included as sons of Abraham and therefore in the blessings of the son of Abraham, as, as sons of Abraham. God had one plan. The one plan was redemption. He told Abraham he would use this plan to, he would use him to bring this plan of redemption to be. And that plan has always been and always will be grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Period. Anybody else, anywhere else that preaches something different is not preaching the gospel. It's a false gospel. Faith alone because of God's grace alone through God's son Jesus alone, period. That's what saves you, period, period. You cannot justify yourself to a holy God. We have an incorruptible, everlasting inheritance because of being included in this blessing. This is good news coming up right here. This is good news. Skip down to verse 29, chapter 3, verse 29. For you, all, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Because you have faith in Christ, you are heirs, like you, you can inherit something, you are an heir to the promise to the promises of Abraham, the promise to be blessed by God and be a bless, blessing for God eternally. Remember what he said? I'm going to re-up this covenant with your son Isaac and it will be an everlasting covenant, not stoppable by man or Satan or death or sin or anything else. It is an eternal thing. Just like he promised Abraham 4,000 years ago would happen, same thing. He then further explains this concept, continuing in chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, taking us back to where we finished last week and back to Advent, Galatians chapter 4. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, to be adopted into Israel, to be adopted as sons of Abraham and heirs to this promise. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son, there's the triune God all in one right there, of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave of the law, but a son, and if a son, <laughs> then an heir through God. God's one and only plan was to redeem mankind from the choice of sin. It's always been his plan. He chose Abraham as the man he would accomplish this plan through. And his seed, Jesus, the son of Abraham, was the ultimate fulfillment of this promise. And just like it was credited to Abraham as righteousness because he believed that it would happen one day, he was, had forward-facing faith, it is credited to you Today, as righteousness, as you believe that this is what happened, that God has redeemed us through his son, Christ Jesus, on the cross, blood shed for you and for me to redeem us forever, that through Jesus, we were bought back to God at an incalculable price. You can't add it up. That where God the Father spared Abraham from sacrificing his son, Isaac, and provided a goat instead, he would not spare his own son, Christ Jesus, as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Jesus is the son of Abraham, and you should be well glad that he is today. Last week, our Advent word was hope. This week, it is joy. Joy, because we are no longer slaves to the law, but we are free, for the Son has made us free indeed. That is our joy. I've got joy because Jesus... The son of Abraham has come to bring the blessing of salvation to the world. I've got joy because the son of Abraham has come. God keeps his promises. When Satan whispers in your ear, you're not worthy. You say, I'm a child of God. Co-heir to the blessing of heaven. God promised prominence to Abraham and to his seed. I'm an adopted son of that blessing because Jesus is the son of Abraham. When life seems overwhelming and you're grasping for a straw, you say, Jesus is the son of Abraham. God keeps his promises. And he promised to never leave me and never forsake me. 
when tragedy strikes, whatever that tragedy may be, and it's going to strike, it's going to happen in more ways than one most of the time. When tragedy strikes and the deep, dark hole of suffering and pain and despair is calling you deeper and deeper and deeper into that pit, you say, I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Yeah, see, we we have some church up here today. Y'all may not be fired up, but I'm fired up. I've got the joy in my heart, down in my heart to stay because God keeps his promises. And God promised protection eternal protection to Abraham and to his seed. I'm an adopted son of that blessing because Jesus is the son of Abraham. You, person of faith in Jesus, and therefore are co-heirs to the blessings of heaven with Jesus, co-heirs to the promises to Abraham and to his seed. You are part of something so big and so special Nothing will bring you more meaning or purpose to your life than living out the faithful calling God has placed you, placed on your life for his kingdom, to live in his kingdom now. Live for Jesus now. Love your neighbor. Bless those who curse you. Don't return evil for evil, but overcome evil by doing good. Bring heaven to earth all your earthly days until Jesus comes back and brings heaven with him. Follower of Jesus. You can do it. Live with joy. Jesus is the son of Abraham and those who have faith and therefore belong to Christ. You are Abraham's seed and co-heirs with Jesus according to the promise of God the Father. We have joy today. We have joy tomorrow. We have joy forever because God keeps his promises. Amen. Let's sing to that God as we finish up with this song today.